Hey, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for what is going to be another big benchmark video. This time I'm focusing on Ryzen's gaming performance. Previously, or my Ryzen day one review, I only covered four games and only tested at 1080p, which is generally how you test, but let's not go into that one again. Anyway, for this one, fortunately I have tested 16 games at not just 1080p, but also 1440p. Also added to the testing are results for the 1800X and 1700X with SMT disabled. Longtime subscriber Yak has pointed out a very unique problem with the Windows 10 scheduler for Ryzen processors, which was discovered by some users over on the Anantech forums. Apparently Windows 10 treats all Ryzen threads the same, not identifying SMT from physical cores. This means Windows thinks all threads have access to their own level 2 and level 3 cache. I'll touch on this a bit more in another video soon, but for now this is why SMT can hurt performance in some situations. For these updated results I built a brand new test system around the Gigabyte X370 Gaming 5 motherboard and strapped on the EK XLC Predator 240 all-in-one liquid cooler for good measure. The Gaming 5 was updated with the latest F3F BIOS revision, and my Corsair DDR4 memory was indeed running at 1.5 GHz for a double data rate of 3000 mega transfers per second. This then is showing Ryzen in the best possible light in its current condition. And this is indeed the performance you guys as consumers can expect to see. For some reason a vocal minority, which are obviously AMD fans, have been calling for reviewers to stop testing Ryzen until it has time to mature. That's a strange request I have to say. If AMD were to pull sales until they're happy with where Ryzen's at, then it might make sense. Anyway guys, I'm not going to stop retesting Ryzen, expect constant updates. There are so many more different tests I want to do, and of course as claims of improved performance are made, I will be investigating those right away. Hopefully we'll be able to closely monitor Ryzen's gains over the next few weeks, months, several months, and so on. There's no point saying don't test Ryzen now in games as they aren't optimised for it. I'm hardly going to run a few game tests now and call it a day and shut the book on Ryzen. I think most of you guys know me better than that by now. I'm going to be doing so much Ryzen testing I could dedicate a separate channel to all the data I will be collecting. So with the results from 16 games now in at two resolutions featuring 11 different processors plus the two disabled SMT configurations, we have a total of 416 results to look at from at least 1250 individual benchmark runs. Gathering all that data took around four full days of work. Thankfully, I had the foresight to test the Intel processors in advance just before Ryzen arrived. Anyway, that's all behind me now. Let's get to the results. Starting with The Division, we find a rather severe GPU bottleneck even at 1080p when using the ultra quality settings. Of course, it's not until we look at the dual core Intel chips or the AMD FX8370 that we start to see performance fall away ever so slightly. As you would expect, the 1440p resolution looks much the same. The dual core Intel chips catch up for the average frame rate, but still lack ever so slightly when looking at the minimum. Needless to say, the Ryzen CPUs all do very well here. Next up we have Hitman, which I have tested using DirectX 11. In terms of performance, the Ryzen CPUs are similar to the Core i7-5960X, which makes them a good bit slower than the 6900K, 6700K and 7700K processors. Performance is slightly better than the unlocked Core i5 Skylake and KB Lake CPUs, and disabling SMT support doesn't have much of an impact on performance here, though it did afford us a few extra frames. Moving to 1440p we find some interesting changes in the results, that's so they are mostly expected. Naturally, as the GPU becomes the more performance limiting factor, margins between the CPUs narrow. The 1800X, for example, is now just 11% slower than the 6900K, where it was 19% slower at 1080p. Overall, strong performance on the Ryzen CPUs here, as they roughly match the 5960X. The Civilization 6 numbers might seem surprising, but AMD's own review guide, which they shared with media, showed Ryzen to be quite a bit down on performance here in relation to the Intel CPUs. Still, the performance was far from poor, as the 1800X was just 10% slower than the 6900K at 1080p. Jumping to 1440p, the results don't change much. The 1800X is still 10% slower than the 6900K, which is obviously a commendable effort and a solid result for AMD. I have tweaked my testing methodology for Overwatch ever so slightly. I now run a 12 player bot match while spectating. The bots are set to the easy difficulty and I use the Zarya character on the Ilias map. 
Once the bots from opposing teams meet in the middle of the map, or somewhere around there, the battle takes place and I start my test, which runs for five minutes. Uh, because the bots are set to easy and the character that I'm using, they don't actually ever seem to be able to kill each other, so it's just an all-out non-stop battle. It actually provides really nice, accurate results. And as always, I take the average and minimum frame rates uh, as an average from three runs. The only other change made to the testing has been the upgrade from the ultra quality preset to the epic quality preset, which helps to knock the frame rates down from that 300 FPS cap. At 1080p, we see, like my previous test, the Ryzen processors don't look particularly impressive when looking at the average frame rate, albeit they are plenty fast enough to drive a 144Hz display in this title. Still, what's important to note here is the minimum frame rate. Out of the box, the 1800X isn't much slower than the 5960X. Meanwhile, with SMT disabled, it actually pulls ahead. So then we have a good example here of why the Windows scheduler really needs to be updated for the Ryzen processors. Now at 1440p, we see Ryzen becomes very competitive. The 1800X pulls ahead of the 5960X out of the box, and this time disabling SMT doesn't lead to the same big gains for the minimum frame rate. I have to say, both the 1800X and 1700X CPUs look really good here. For some reason, in Mirror's Edge Catalyst, the Ryzen CPUs hit a bit of a wall, albeit at well over 100 FPS. The 6900K went on to average 146 FPS, while the Ryzen processors seemed to stop at around 138 FPS. The good news is, though, this made them just 5% slower. Moving to 1440p, the results tighten up, and now the Ryzen processors are just 2% slower than the 6900K, while matching its minimum frame rate. So we are seeing Ryzen pretty well get the most out of the Titan XP at 1440p in Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Mafia 3 has some very interesting figures for us. First and foremost, Ryzen can be seen kicking some serious silicon here. This is one of the very few games where you will see Broadwell E smoking KB Lake. The 1800X gets right amongst it, matching the 5960X to tail the 6900K by a very slim margin. And these are 1080p results. It's also interesting to note that disabling SMT actually hurts performance as the 1800X becomes 7% slower. Things get even more interesting at 1440p. Here the 1800X actually takes the top spot on our graph. Granted it is just 1 FPS ahead of the 6900K and 5960X. This is still well within the margin of error, but a great result nonetheless. Again, disabling SMT hurts performance by quite a bit in Mafia 3. Performance when testing with Gears of War 4 is better with SMT disabled. The minimum frame rate is slightly improved while we see decent gains for the average frame rates. Overall though, Ryzen looks quite average at 1080p as it trails the 5960X and struggles to match the minimum frame rate of the Core i5-7600K. Now at 1440p, the Ryzen CPUs look much more competitive and while the average frame rate is a bit slower than you might have hoped for, the average is still quite strong. I have to say the Ryzen CPUs look a bit lost in Deus Ex Mankind Divided, as both the 1800X and 1700X fall behind the 5960X by a fair margin. That said, turning SMT off does boost the average frame rate significantly in this title, though oddly the minimum remains much the same. Overall, not a great showing in this DirectX 12 title at 1080p, which is quite strange given how closely AMD worked with the developer. Obviously AMD focused on optimizations for Polaris, but you thought they might revisit the game for Ryzen. In any case, upping the resolution to 1440p using the very high quality settings, we run into a GPU bottleneck and now Ryzen looks quite impressive. Disabling SMT also has no impact on performance here. Yet more interesting results, this time when testing with Battlefield 1. Here the 1800X is just 8% slower than the 6900K for the average result, and 10% slower for the minimum, so a decent result. Disabling SMT didn't impact the average frame rate, but the minimum was 23% lower on the 1800X, which is very interesting. Moving to 1440p, the 1800X and 1700X looked very competitive, as they roughly matched the 7700K and 6900K. F1 2016 runs better with SMT disabled. Here we see a 7% boost for the average frame rate and a massive 16% increase for the minimum. With SMT disabled, the 1800X is roughly on par with the 5960X and just 7% slower than the 6900K. Moving to 1440p, we find yet more interesting and this time confusing results. Here disabling SMT slightly reduces performance. 
Go figure. Anyway, out of the box, the 1800X was on par with the 6900K. Although the Ryzen processors look very weak in Total War Warhammer, this is clearly a game that doesn't require more than four cores, as evident by the Core i5 versus 6900K results. That being the case, it's not surprising to find that disabling SMT here leads to considerable performance gains. In fact, with SMT disabled, the 1800X actually pulls ahead of the 6900K, whereas previously out of the box it was 8% slower. Moving to 1440p, the results between the Broadwell E and Ryzen CPUs is much the same. With the added GPU load, the Skylake and KB Lake processors don't enjoy quite the same lead as they did at 1080p. Again, the Ryzen CPUs look average at 1080p when compared to the 6900K and of course Core i5 and Core i7 KB Lake CPUs, this time when testing with Grand Theft Auto 5. Ryzen was faster with SMT disabled in GTA 5, though the gains weren't large enough to really better their position. Now at 1440p, Ryzen does look more competitive, and with SMT disabled, the 1800X roughly matches the 6900K. Watch Dogs 2 results are a little confusing because despite all 16 threads on the Ryzen CPUs being heavily utilised, the performance isn't that impressive. The 6900K and 5960X for example crush the quad-core Core i7 chips, yet Ryzen doesn't enjoy the same gains. Obviously this is an optimization issue. Even at 1440p, we see that Ryzen isn't terribly competitive in Watch Dogs 2, which is a shame. Again, hopefully something can be done to better support AMD's Ryzen CPUs in this title. Armour 3 isn't a game I really like to test with, but after all the passionate requests I received on my Ryzen review, I feared you guys might burn the channel to the ground if I excluded it again. Despite poor utilisation, the 1800X actually looks quite good in relation to the 6900K, though unsurprisingly the higher clocked KB Lake and Skylake chips offer much better performance in this title. The 1440p results are much the same, though the 6900K and Ryzen CPUs are more competitive with the Core i5s here. Far Cry Primal isn't a particularly CPU demanding game, and it doesn't utilise a large number of threads. Out of the box, despite offering smooth performance, the Ryzen 7 1800X and 1700X are actually seen to be slower than the Pentium G4560. However, disabling SMT support boosts performance by 14%, and now the 1800X is on par with the 6900K. The 1440p results are more competitive, and again with SMT disabled, the 1800X is able to rub transistors with the 6900K. See, I told you guys I would get a For Honor CPU benchmark done. This counts, right? <laughs> anyway, like Far Cry, this isn't a CPU intensive game. That said, Ryzen CPUs do rather well here and beat up the 6900K. Moving to 1440p, we get a hard GPU bottleneck with the Titan XP, so the results are very much shaped here. Okay, so this is by no means conclusive data, but I know many of you really like it when I take all the games tested and provide the average performance in one nice, easy to read graph, so here we are. From the 16 games tested, we see that disabling SMT on the 1800X ended up delivering an average of 3% more performance for the average frame rate and just 1% for the minimum. So overall, not a big difference. Of course, the effectiveness of turning SMT off at this point did vary quite a bit from game to game. Hopefully before too long, gamers will be able to leave SMT on without having to worry about losing performance in certain games. Out of the box, the Ryzen 7 1800X was on average 12% slower than the 6900K, and that seems in line with what we found originally at 1080p. So not much else needs to be said here then. Moving to 1440p, the 1800X is now just 4% slower than the 6900K, so a huge improvement with the Titan XP. With SMT disabled, the 1800X came out on par with the 6600K and 5960X, so overall quite good results were seen at 1440p, but remember we are kind of running into a GPU bottleneck here, so I'll let you guys argue about which resolution is more useful. Disabling SMT sent performance backwards in Armour 3, Battlefield 1, Mafia 3 and Watch Dogs 2. Meanwhile it boosted performance in Deus Ex Mankind Divided, F1 2016, Far Cry Primal, Gears of War 4, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch and Total War Warhammer. All these games played better on the horizon with SMT disabled, though mileage did vary. Finally, much the same performance was seen in Civilization VI, For Honor, Hitman, Mirror's Edge Catalyst, and The Division. The key thing to note here when looking at the Intel CPUs is the fact that at 1080p, the 1800X trailed the 6900K by 12%. Of course, once we move to 1440p, that figure shrunk to just 4%. I think you can guess what will happen at 4K. 
So what have we learned? Well, honestly, not much compared to the original review. The findings are all sort of in line with that. We just have a bit more data now and we've seen that there are places where Ryzen does do very well. So now we are waiting on optimization to sort of enhance the overall experience, if you will. Um, and that will come from things like, you know, board uh, partners, improved BIOSes, um, Microsoft will improve their operating support, no doubt, and game developers as well. So hopefully AMD can work closely with game developers to better support Ryzen. So I believe all that's coming and AMD promised it is, that it is. And I don't think we have another bulldozer sort of situation on our hands where promises are made and they're not really followed through with. I think AMD has a real winner on their hands with Ryzen. Speaking of operating system support, the first really useful step would be to fix SMT support. And that should be a fairly easy step to accomplish. And doing so will really improve performance, especially in games. Um, and I know that last graph where I compiled all 16 games and just looked at the average uh, frame rate or the average frame rate and the minimum frame rate uh, and disabling SMT didn't look particularly useful there, but that's because in some games, disabling SMT actually hurt performance. So once the operating system is optimized for SMT, we should see really strong improvements uh, right across the board. And SMT itself will be more efficient, but then when it's not able to be utilized, the operating system won't be grabbing threads instead of physical cores, so we will see better performance. So as I said originally, the cheapest Ryzen CPU, being the 1700 without the X, is going to be a great option for those not interested in high refresh rate gaming and want to either game at 4K or with a more reasonable mid-range GPU. For those scenarios, I think I personally would pick the 1700 over the 7700K as it feels like a safer bet long term and of course right now productivity is much stronger. Of course, the other side of that being if you were a gamer that was targeting 1080p or 1440p, 144Hz, high refresh rate gaming, then I feel like a KB Lake 7700K or the Skylake 6700K would probably be a better choice. As I've already said, I will be following Ryzen's development or how it matures very closely, uh, doing a lot of testing and reporting that data back to you guys. So there's going to be plenty more Ryzen testing to come. And I also, there's some different kind of testing I want to do as well when I get time. So there'll be plenty more Ryzen benchmarks, but I'm not going to make this Ryzen unboxed. The channel won't be changing to a, a Ryzen benchmark channel. There'll be plenty of other non-Ryzen related content, as difficult as that is going to be at the moment, because I'm so excited about Ryzen and want to test so many different things. But yeah, there'll be other content to come. Uh, but there will be a Ryzen system coming. Um, and I don't mean a Ryzen build for me, it's more for you guys, or one lucky you guys. <laughs> uh, I will be building a Ryzen 1800X system, full system, really cool case, graphics card, motherboard, obviously the processor, the whole lot, and that will be for a giveaway for one lucky subscriber. So be sure to keep your lids peeled for that because there will be more details to come. Anyway, that's all for now. I'm your host, Steve. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the benchmarks, and I'll catch you next time.